Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Hada tonight. As we promised before the break, we're going to continue to look at the rate by, uh, by which Israeli forces are killing Palestinian civilians. Uh, most, most cases we see Palestinians demonstrating against the conditions, the brutal conditions that they're being forced to live under without anyone being able to come to their aid. And so uh, just the last news item that we just looked at uh, has to do with these extrajudicial killings. As we've said, we're joined by Professor Imad Muhana. He is a professor of uh, political science and strategic studies, also a member of the Council of Egyptian Scholars, a, an, an advisory council to the uh, president, Office of the Presidency uh, here in Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Professor. Welcome to Hada tonight. Wa alaikum salam, and thanks for having me. Yeah, Thank it's you. our pleasure. So, so these numbers are quite uh, alarming. 85%, according yep. to this report, of those killed by Israeli forces are uh, the forces acting as the executioner in the streets. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, they are uh, killed in cold blood, as, as we say. Mm. If, if we go back, actually, um, in history, looking at the Arab-Israeli struggle, uh, starting from 1947, where um, Palestine, uh, likewise, or likewise Egypt, was under the protection rule uh, of England, um, uh, we were surprised that the Israelis were giving and were promised the national uh, state of Israel, mm. the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. And since that time, Israelis really followed the same approach in killing the Arabs in a cold blood, whether they are Muslims or Christians, mm -hmm. uh, no difference whatsoever. And basically pushing them out of the country. And now we're talking uh, up to 2014, talking uh, about more than 50,000 uh, um, Palestinians killed um, in, in, in cold blood. Mm. Um, uh, that's that's 50,000 from which time period? From, uh, from 1948. I see. Okay. And uh, looking at different periods where it, uh, uh, it exceeded uh, uh, the expected numbers, like the First Intifada, we're talking about almost 7,000. Uh, we talked about probably 20,000 at some stages in the 90s. So uh, throughout the Israeli-Arab conflict, the mm -hmm. Israelis really followed the same approach, killing the Arabs uh, in a cold blood, mm. uh, um, uh, having no respect whatsoever for the constitution. Uh, of the uh, uh, or the um, the human rights uh, constitution of the United Nations or the uh, human rights high commission uh, also not taking any uh, uh, resolutions of the security council into account including the 242 uh, so that's always the case and uh, uh, yes, still the numbers are alarming, and whether it's going to stay like this or the world is going to start putting an end to this slaughter of the Arabs uh, in, in the Palestine occupied land, uh, that's what we hope to see uh, in the near future. And uh, the political uh, arena is also used uh, yes. not only brute force in the streets, uh, but uh, tonight we talked about a leader of. Uh, the Fatah on the yes. Central Committee, uh, Mr. Abbas Zaki. He was speaking in Jordan uh, on the weekend, and he says in his speech that the U.S. has threatened to list Fatah as a terrorist organization yeah. if they pr continue with these uh, charges in, with the International Criminal Court. Yeah. That's, that's exactly the same thing. If you look at the actual, uh, I would call it assassination of uh, Mr. Um, Yasser Arafat, mm. uh, the assassination came about when he started to look at using forces at some point where, um, you know, peace talks are not really taking them anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so he started to really withdraw slowly from the um, uh, peace negotiations where it just goes on and on and on. And we've been going on for about 60 years and nothing really is taking place. Um, Israelis, because Israelis always used to just uh, uh, ignore the peace talks. And if they come to the peace talks, it doesn't last very long because they have their own conditions to the talks. And in, in the end, it's not really fair. Um, so it wasn't really based on, on uh, uh, justice. Mm. And uh, this is what President Sadat used to say, is that you never negotiate from a weakness point because mm -hmm. you will always mm -hmm. lose. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mr. Arafat, in his uh, few, few, few months before uh, his assassination, I think his approach was that the, we're really giving up on the peace talks with Israel. They don't really want to progress. Mm -hmm. And it's just uh, playing on time. Mm. And I think Mr. Abbas is probably getting into the same mode where he can't see any 
any results on the ground level uh, because Israelis just take too long to get back to the negotiating table and when they get to the table they have their own conditions and right. they have their own agendas. One very uh, dangerous um, point here when it comes to solving the conflict is that the Western society always uses the media to frame the Arabs mm -hmm. as terrorist organizations. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we go back in history a few uh, years back when uh, the reconciliation was done between Fatah and Hamas and we had the United Government and it was blown up by the American media saying now we cannot recognize Hamas as party to uh, to this negotiation right uh, and and therefore Hamas took a different approach and now it became uh, a terrorist organization right. so they classified it we go through through the same approach and uh, whether Mr. Abbas will continue uh, on the terms and conditions of Israel to become uh, you know party to this negotiation on his own terms of the Israeli terms or is going to take a different approach and again as you see from the threat uh, if you take a different approach to the uh, Palestinian case we're going to classify you as a terrorist organization mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's not fair at all whether uh, you basically want me to negotiate based on your terms and mm -hmm. if I don't like that then you classify me and here again is when we talk about the fourth and fifth generation of wars is basically looking at war of information, the war of the media, and uh, basically Israelis are using that quite well. Mm. Uh, people or the, the citizens of the world, talking about almost uh, uh, 7 billion people, most of them don't know about the Palestinian case as it should be. All they know is just some uh, um, a fight or a conflict or over a piece of land, but they actually never knew uh, the actual case. At this and point, we should, we should media mention... media plays a, a very important role. Is, uh, we should mention, the Professor, a admission that the BBC rec recently uh, made uh, just a few weeks ago, actually, at the end of last year. They monitoring groups have been watching the portrayal of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, conflict yeah. uh, and the way the BBC was portraying it. Uh, focusing on Israel and yeah. the uh, Israeli injuries and all this and ignoring exactly. completely. Exactly. And so finally, after the, a, a lot mm. of pressure, the uh, uh, BBC admitted that they have a bias. Yes. Uh, approach in in in, uh, in filming that yeah. this is this is always the case um, even if you look at the Holocaust and what was called as the six million Jews killed in the Second World War is not true they're not more than six thousand and it was actually due to uh, social and uh, economic as well as uh, political conflict with with Hitler so the the number uh, of the Jews killed in the Second World War was blown out of, out of proportion basically to attract uh, basically peoples uh, of the world attention uh, they've always uh, used the media as their first weapon, uh, basically. And even if you look at the war in 1967, the mm -hmm. war in 1973, and the 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 long hand of Israel, the long arm of Israel, it's just always. And and if you look at even at the verses, the holy verses of the Quran, it always uh, confirms that the Jews will always betray and portray themselves as the uh, a strong party and in the end they are peaceful loving nation and uh, it's their enemies that always uh, you know step on their toes so the fact here what you're saying about the BBC is always the the, the same approach used by different media uh, uh, channels basically framing the Arabs as the bad part uh, of the uh, conflict and the Israelis as uh, basically a peaceful nation but if you look at the actual origin of the conflict where did the Jew come from uh, the Jews that that lived in the Middle East or the Palestinian area are the Arab Jews it's got nothing to do with the Europeans and the people uh, of Palestine as well as the people uh, the rest of the Arab world are or Arab speaking belong to the Arab nation meaning that they are whether Muslims Christians or Jews but they are Arabs but once you make a Jewish state then you change approach into a religious state, mm -hmm. which is totally different to the cultural approach that the that unites all. Right, right, apps. right. Okay, so I mean, there are so many uh, important aspects to this uh, issue to talk about. Let's go back, if we can, to uh, this report about the uh, way the, the high percentages of extrajudicial killings. Yeah. Uh, since October the first, uh, this was the. Uh, somehow the unofficial date of the 
uh, so-called third intifada, commonly yep. referred to as the ninth intifada. Yeah. Uh, 100 and more than 150 have been killed since yeah. uh, October. That's just a few weeks. Yeah. Um, can you talk also about this issue that is very well documented with photographs and videos of Israeli soldiers using children yep. as human shields? Uh, uh, this is a uh, very unfortunate and uh, it's amazing that this can this can happen without any type of uh, punishment yes uh, of course let's look at the ideology uh, that drives wars or the ideologies that basically uh, uh, makes the soldier uh, uh, himself strong to fight or the cause what uh, that basically makes a soldier fight if you look at the Israeli soldiers, they are weak because they have no right. They know, that in, in, you know, inside themselves and in their hearts, they know they've got no right in what they're doing. And therefore, they, they lack the, the power, an internal power that basically drives them to fight uh, for the nation because they've got no cause. Unlike the Muslims, for example, uh, or the Christians where they have a cause, they, they fight to either, you know, if they, they are dead, in, they are in paradise, so it's either victory or the paradise. Mm. But the Israeli soldiers are weak in themselves, and therefore they have to always have a shield to fight behind. Mm -hmm. And this is what was mentioned in the Quran, that they always, they, they uh, um, uh, it's, it's what basically the verse refers to is that they always fight you from behind the shield. Mm. They always, they never confront you. Mm -hmm. and, and that confrontation always comes out uh, just as a reflection of a cause or an ideology or a reason what you fight for. It's something that you believe in. Mm. So, Looking at that, the Israelis will always use a shield, whether it's a, a Barlev uh, line that was established between 1967 and 73, that's mm. their approach. Uh, they've got now uh, maybe uh, castles, uh, reaching to the point where they got nothing to the using human shields. Mm. So what is showing out of that is how weak the Israeli nation is, mm. how weak the Israeli uh, army is, and how weak and uh, vulnerable the Israeli soldier is. And it basically makes us feel good that you are winning this war because you own the media, you own weapons, but you don't have a cause. And this is what we have as, as uh, Arabs. We have the cause that we're fighting for. And what basically I'm s trying to say is that whether it lasts long or short, mm -hmm. it's going to end. Mm -hmm. Israel is going to vanish because it's mm -hmm. got no cause, it's got no value in the region, and it's just a, 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 a test, a, a transition period that we have mm -hmm. to go through. Unfortunate that part of our nation is paying the price for that but it's always make you know uh, it makes us uh, feel good and strong that we have a cause and it's a holy now despite uh, this uh, terrible history and the numbers of these extra judicial killings etc when you talk to the nominal Palestinian they are they they have this amazing uh, belief uh, this amazing strength, this amazing, uh, it's, it's almost unbelievable how they can have this positive outlook on life. Yeah. Uh, this resolve to continue and to not cave in. Yes, uh, because, because they believe in the cause. They right, know. this is what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. They, they believe in the cause. They know it's temporary. Um, Sheikh Shahrawi, I think at some point, um, talked about that. He said that the Arabs are very uh, um, sad about the occupation in the Palestinian land. Mm -hmm. But let's just think about it. Uh, uh, how is it that we can finish and uh, make Israel vanish if they are scattered all over the world. They have to be gathered, they have to be in one place so we can basically uh, uh, finish them. <laughs> and it's very wise if you actually look at it. So the fact here is we're not justifying what they're doing, but what we're saying is there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It is a test for us. God is testing us. The, the we have to always remain uh, strong, 
believing in our cause, mm. believing in our religion, believing mm. in our culture, that this is going to end. Mm. Uh, uh, the tomorrow's for us, definitely. Tomorrow is for the Arabs, and we, as as we've led the world many decades ago, we're going to come to lead it again. This is just the time where uh, we lost our vision. And I think we're paying the price for that, but it is going to come back. A second, uh, a second ago, you talked about, um, uh, you referred to the uh, Holocaust uh, yes. by the Nazis in the 1940s. Last week, just last week, uh, a, uh, an American uh, rabbi uh, yeah. in New York City, uh, a very controversial figure, made the same statement that you made. Yeah. He said that the actual number of Jews, according yeah. to Jewish law, all those people, the six million, were not Jews. That's right. They, uh, you can't just call yourself a Jew anyhow. There's a certain That's right. protocol. That's right. Uh, you, your mother and all these things have to be Jews. And so he says uh, the actual number is actually less than one million. Yeah. And so if this was, in fact, the basis, as you said, yeah. to gather international sympathy and support to That's make right. the case for the creation of Israel, then, as you say, I mean, it's a, it's a weak foundation. Absolutely. But they are, they are successful in using the media. And, and if you look at even uh, the war that the West led against the Arabs in 1990, it was exactly the same thing. Uh, there is uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And, and what now? We, we, you know, they destroyed a nation, uh, five or six million people are drinking water from the sewage. Uh, we've got millions of people, over 12 million misplaced. Hmm. Uh, so the fact here is, uh, it's the media that is becoming a, a, a very powerful yeah. uh, weapon. Mm. And, and it basically helps those, uh, um, let's call it bad um, colonial uh, nations that they used to have that uh, military confrontation now fighting uh, without actually having to get involved. Mm -hmm. they, they create that psychological uh, defeat and this is what we really suffer from in the Arab world. We, we suffer from a psychological defeat mm -hmm. that basically we find that the rest of the world doesn't like us because we are terrorists but in actual fact it is a, a, a frame that was portrayed by the, uh, uh, the media itself, uh, funded by the Zionist organization. So the Arabs now need to relook at the situation. What is it that we used to do that allowed them to do that? It's the unity that we need to look at. It, we, we need to look at cultural development where we can regain our self-confidence and not just our self-confidence as nation, but in our religion, in our values, in our traditions, and become stronger societies to be able to defend our cases. I mean, um, y y another very controversial practice is um, picking up people uh, and putting them in detention without charging them with any crime uh, and um, without going to trial. Uh, yeah. This practice of administrative detention and most many of the children who are picked up are for throwing stones. We're talking about a heavily armed uh, mm -hmm. military force with advanced weapons from the United States and others. Uh, and children are being picked up for throwing stones at armored yeah. soldiers. Yeah. Uh, th this uh, has caused uh, another, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of trying to create a sense of defeat. Targeting yes. children, putting them yes. un under these, uh, uh, and and it's got a, a very valuable point that basically it is the main aim uh, behind uh, capturing uh, kids. Mm. Um, it really sends a, a strong signal that we're gonna make. The Jews are basically telling the Arabs that we're gonna make you a nation without a future. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the fact. Why are they targeting the kids? And uh, let's uh, look at the 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 Western conspiracy. Uh, over the Middle East and what uh, was known as the um, the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. The focus here, because the, the Arab nation is a very young nation, you're talking about over 60% are between the age of 15 and 40. So it's a young nation, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, the future of this nation is absolutely powerful uh, against the Western societies, whether they are in Western Europe or United States and their allies. So what they're trying to do is damage the 
competitive advantage of this nation. And the competitive advantage, mm -hmm. of, uh, advantage of this nation is the human capital. Human capital and not at any age. If you look at Europe, for example, it's an aging society. So you're talking probably over 60% are over the age of 40. Mm -hmm. It's other way around Opposite. in the Arab world. Yeah. So why are they targeting our kids with drugs? Uh, 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 mass media, the um, social networks, uh, destruction, the rumors war, which basically, if you look at the fourth and fifth generation wars, are targeted at information. Information looks at or targeted at youth. Hmm. So what they're trying to do uh, in brief is kill the future of the Arab mm -hmm. world uh, through damaging the youth, through different areas, uh, misleading them, uh, damaging education, culture, whatever. But here again, particularly at Palestine, uh, because a lot of these tools cannot be used like in culture or education or social media. So what they're doing now is basically capturing these kids and uh, try to kill them. So what the, the challenge they're putting uh, for us here is destroying our future. And this is what we need to understand. Uh, the damage would have been a lot less if an older man was killed. We're not saying it's right, but, mm. but the damage is less than yeah. having a child. Right. So therefore, what they are focusing on besides beating us is basically killing our future. The future. So I'll beat you today and I'll beat you tomorrow. And the Israeli That's cabinet the uh, has even talked about uh, penalties as stiff as up to 20 years. Absolutely. So when he comes stones. out of prison, yeah. he's already damaged yeah. as, as a person. The, the unfortunate here is that uh, media basically uh, is owned by Western societies, and Western societies are basically very, very controlling the uh, International Court of Justice, where no criminal uh, uh, were pulled out of Israel to basically prosecute them uh, based on their actions uh, against uh, uh, civilians. That, that, was my next, is, yeah. that was my next question. I was going to ask you for your opinion, for yep. the prospects for these uh, f uh, charges that have been filed with the ICC. Yep. You know, they applied, it's been a year now since they applied for membership. Yep. April last year, they got uh, officially admitted as a member. Yep. And uh, so the ICC has had the paperwork now for, you know, several months now. Yes. Uh, they conducted the preliminary investigation. Uh, but we, I think we're still waiting to hear yep. if there's enough uh, evidence to pursue a full investigation. And full investigation. And if you look at other cases where, uh, for example, Kuwait was done uh, in uh, 24 hours because the Western society has intention in the oil in the Kuwait uh, region. So here you can see very easily it's a double standard dealing uh, with uh, the Arab cases. Hmm. But let me tell you, it's, it's you know, it, it could be a problem because they are, as we call them, you know, double standard dealings. But, but I think it goes back to the weakness of the Arab as a nation. Mm -hmm. uh, the world respects the powerful. Mm -hmm. United States, when they put something on a table, it gets taken seriously. Russia is the same. Mm -hmm. England, France, Germany. Uh, Japan, not so much because they were beaten in, in, in the Second World War. So we need to look at how we change ourselves to become a strong, influential nation. Mm -hmm. This is really the case. And I think we could have been very influential nation through oil, because oil is what drives the world's economy. So we could achieve or compensate for the political power through economic power. So in other words, United States and Russia enjoy uh, military power, and they can really enforce their own conditions on anyone. But we have the oil where we can stop the rest of the world if you don't adhere to our rules, uh, uh, basically, we will stop the oil uh, uh, supply to the rest of the world. So I think it goes back to us. If we become a strong nation, I think the, the rest of the world will take us into account and our cases will be heard. Mm. Okay, uh, I think we're uh, approaching uh, the end uh, of this uh, segment. Uh, we have so much to keep our eyes on. Uh, what kinds of things, as we start to close this out, what kinds of things do we need to be focusing on when we look at the news? Uh, and uh, just any other final comments about... Uh, uh, I think uh, the, the Arabs, what they need to look at, number one, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just mention it briefly in three points. Number one is looking at reform of the Arab League, mm -hmm. where basically we write the constitution 
uh, basically or the declaration of the Arab League that basically allows us to create our uh, own uh, joint forces, uh, military forces, because mm -hmm. at the moment the declaration doesn't allow it. Mm -hmm. uh, it changes the way uh, we vote as Arabs on, on cases, and one of the uh, cases will be the Palestinian case. Uh, number two, um, looking at the cooperation, economic cooperation, so we need to enforce the achievement of the Arab joint venture. And according to uh, my studies, that uh, the Arab world will take no more than four years to achieve a higher economic return than the European Union, uh, and it becomes stronger. And part of that is having a parallel uh, currency where we can have like a dinar for example that mm -hmm. between Egypt and Saudi Arabia we can exchange uh, goods and services through that local uh, Arab currency. Uh, the third one is we need to look after our youth uh, through creating uh, that integration between the youth in all Arab world to basically uh, bring that uh, spirit back of all Arabs no Egyptians, no Saudis, no Palestinians. We all are Arabs mm. carry the mm. same uh, uh, word Arabs and uh, belong to the same culture. I, uh, just, uh, w they just gave us a couple more minutes. There's a couple more things I want to bring up. Uh, one happened actually this week. Uh, a group of 40 retired Brazilian diplomats yes. signed a letter protesting uh, the new Israeli ambassador to Brazil. Yeah. Uh, they said the complaints were the protocol, they broke the protocol. They didn't consult the Brazilian government. Yeah. They just posted this ambassador without you know, any review of his credentials, etc. Uh, and that also that this new ambassador uh, actually has a home and still lives in an illegal Israeli settlement. Yes. And has said that there is no uh, grounds hope, basically hope, hope. for yeah. the two-state solution yes so they say they reject him and the, the way that uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu appointed him uh, because they are in solidarity yes with the Palestinians yes. increasingly the question that I want you to, to speak to increasingly Latin American countries governments are uh, aligning themselves with not only Palestinians but Arabs in general. Yes. Uh, can, yeah. Yes, ab absolutely. Uh, this is a very good question because we find a lot of close uh, ties between the Arab world and Latin America. Mm. If you look at the globalization or the, the uh, economic expansion in the world, you find that uh, Western Europe, and North America have managed uh, since 1985 and the establishment of World Trade Organization 1995 to basically control the, the resources worldwide. Mm -hmm. So North America managed to manipulate South America. Western Europe managed to manipulate Africa and the Middle East and part of Asia through the uh, uh, British colony. So what you will find that, that the Arab world and Latin America are all countries that went through the same victimization, abuse of the same uh, uh, colonial power. And therefore, they understand very well. And through their involvements and becoming you know, part of the uh, Spanish colonial uh, long ago. So they understand right. the victimization. That's right. They uh, understand the marginalization. And right. they understand how uh, basically segregation can take place. Mm. And therefore, they are very close to us. And I uh, like this question because it's very important that the Arab leaders have really ignored Latin America for quite some time. And mm. I think our future is with Latin America more than even Asia, mm. uh, uh, like India or uh, Indonesia, etc. Mm. I think Latin America is the approach for the Arab, and it's an extension for the Arab national security where we can really around, be around the United States, beat the door. Uh, and, and threaten them uh, uh, with our powers yeah, as yeah. they are actually stepping onto our grounds and threaten uh, our national security. All right, uh, one last question about uh, a unity government. Yes. Uh, like you touched on this a second ago, uh, Fatah and Hamas. Yes. Uh, the U.S., as we said recently, according to this uh, official, Fatah official, U.S. threatened to list Fatah as a terrorist organization. Yes. I'm not sure. Does the U.S. currently list Hamas as a terrorist organization? Yes, they do. They, so, they, they, they have done it that already. And uh, I think uh, that made it a reason for them not to accept Hamas as party to the United Government. Uh -huh. uh, so what we're saying here again, as, as what we were saying earlier, is they either accept my conditions yeah. or I'm going to list you as a terrorist organization. So 
what kind of negotiation is this if you are enforcing your own rules on me? <laughs> There's no negotiation it's here. It's, it's, it's a one-way uh, uh, dictation of rules. So I think here, uh, and, and uh, to be honest, I like that. And I like that dictation they're doing on us because we need to understand as Arabs that we'll never have a solution if we are going to continue to be weak. Mm -hmm. Because we, all we're going to have is a one-way dictation, is not a negotiation. So we don't want to keep dreaming of having to sit around the table in a negotiation and we actually have no power whatsoever right, to right. enforce the other parties to adhere if, if, or if, to abide by it. If it's, if it's only going to be theater. Absolutely. For international perceptions. Absolutely. Uh, the Israelis are... And they play on time. If you look at every time they sit around the table, it takes two, three years. <laughs> and, and through that time, they're building... Uh, more settlements. Uh, uh, more settlements. Mm. So the fact here is, we need a, a final solution once and for all. And it's all or nothing. That's what the Arabs need to look at. Change in our approach, all or nothing. All right. Uh, there's uh, still so much more to, to address, but uh, I think we'll have to end it here for today. Absolutely. Professor, uh, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. We've been joined by Pr uh, Professor Imad Mohana, uh, Professor of Political Science and Strategic Studies, talking about uh, the general status of uh, the Palestinians under the Zionist regime. Uh, and also looking at these uh, rates that Palestinian civilians are being uh, executed in the streets by Israeli forces. We want to take a short break, inshallah, uh, and then come back to continue the program. We're going to be opening a discussion about one of the uh, largest surahs in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah. We'll be right back, inshallah, after a short break.